Ladies and gentlemen, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation proudly welcomes you to the ceremonial swearing-in of the Congressional Black Caucus of the 116th Congress. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours. Oh, one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, glory, 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 oh, glory, glory. Hands to the heavens, no man, no weapon. Formed against, yes, glory is destined. Everyday women and men become legends. Sins that go against our skin become blessings. The movement is a rhythm to us. Freedom is like religion to us. Justice is juxtaposition in us. Justice for all just ain't specific enough. One son died, the spirit is revisiting us. True and living, living in us. Resistance is us. That's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we walk through Ferguson with our hands up. When it go down, we woman and man up. They say stay down, and we stand up. Shots, we on the ground. The camera panned up. King pointed to the mountaintop, and we ran up. One day. When the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours, oh, no. Every man, woman, and child. Even Jesus got his crown in front of a crowd. They march with the torch, we gon' run with it now. Never look back, we done gone hundreds of miles. From dark roads, heroes, to become a hero. Facing the league of justice, his power was the people. Enemy is lethal, a king became regal. Saw the face of Jim Crow under a bald ego. No one can win the war individually. It take the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call Victory, the coming of the Lord, my eyes have seen the glory. One day, when the glory comes, it will be ours, it will be Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our MC, Ms. Angela Rai. Angela Rai is principal and CEO of Impact Strategies, a political advocacy firm in the nation's capital. She is a political commentator for CNN and a political analyst for NPR. Rai has been featured as an influential lawyer and advocate by several media outlets, including Marie Claire, Ebony, and The Washington Post. She is a prominent strategist who has been offered on-air commentary for monthly media outlets, including BET, CNN, NBC, HBO, ABC, MSNBC, and TV One. A former executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus, Rye has an unwavering commitment to ensuring positive change in the political process. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I know it's early, but it's a great history-making kind of day. It's a good day. Distinguished guests, friends, and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, I am honored to serve as your MC for the ceremonial swearing in of the Congressional Black Caucus of the 116th Congress. For nearly 47 years, the CBC has remained the voice for African Americans in Congress. Over that same period, the CBC has become increasingly dominant as a force on social, political, and economic issues impacting African Americans and people all around the globe. Members of the CBC, 
Your leadership on behalf of the African American community and this nation is to be commended, and we are honored to pay tribute to you all today. You all can do better than that, it's a little quiet. These are my former bosses, give it up, give it up. At this time, I'd like to recognize any member of the audience who is a former member of the Congressional Black Caucus. If you would please stand. <laughs> Distinguished guests, it all started with 13 trailblazers and has now grown into the history-making 55 members. Yes. Representing more than 20 states and the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands and membership in both the House and the Senate. This is an amazing accomplishment and this caucus will be an even greater force in the 116th Congress. Now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you all the members of the Congressional Black Caucus of the 116th Congress. Representative John Lewis of Georgia. I would tell you to hold your applause, but you wouldn't listen to me anyway, so that's all right. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton is not with us yet. Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California. <laughs> Representative Sanford D. Bishop, Jr. of Georgia. <laughs> Representative James E. Clyburn of South Carolina and your Democratic whip. <laughs> Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas. Representative Bobby L. Rush of Illinois. <laughs> Representative Robert C. Bobby Scott of Virginia. <laughs> Representative Benny Gordon Thompson of Mississippi. <laughs> Representative Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas and your chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Representative Elijah E. Cummings of Maryland. <laughs> Representative Danny K. Davis of Illinois. <laughs> Representative Barbara Lee of California. <laughs> Representative William Lacey Clay Jr. of Missouri. <laughs> Representative G.K. Butterfield of North Carolina. <laughs> Representative Emmanuel Cleaver II of Missouri. <laughs> Representative Al Green of Texas. <laughs> Representative Gwen Moore of Wisconsin. <laughs> Representative Yvette D. Clark of New York. <laughs> Representative Henry C. Hank Johnson, Jr. of Georgia. Representative Andre Carson of Indiana. <laughs> Representative Marsha L. Fudge of Ohio. <laughs> Representative Terry Sewell of Alabama. <laughs> Representative Frederick, Frederica S. Wilson of Florida. <laughs> Representative Donald M. Payne Jr. of New Jersey. Representative Joyce Beatty of Ohio. <laughs> Representative Hakeem Jeffries of New York. <laughs> Representative Mark Vesey of Texas. Okay, I'm being asked uh, to have you all sit in order. Do you wanna give me? These are my former bosses, so I'm about to get looked at real crazy. Are there any other instructions? <laughs> Sit in order of seniority. You're like, okay, we did the best we could with what we have. <laughs> Y'all gonna get me in trouble. We were giving you an applause break because like I said, I knew you all weren't gonna listen to me anyway. <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm going to let them handle that. Representative Robin Kelly of Illinois. <laughs> Representative Alma Adams of North Carolina. I think you all switched orders. 
Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. Representative Brenda Lawrence of Michigan. Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman of New Jersey. Representative Dwight Evans of Pennsylvania. Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware. Representative Anthony Brown of Maryland. Representative Val Butler Demings of Florida. Representative Al Lawson of Florida. Representative A. Donald McEachin of Virginia. Representative Stephen Horsford of Nevada, welcome back. <laughs> Representative Antonio Delgado of New York. Quick pause, okay. Don't they look wonderful? Representative Colin Alred of Texas. Representative Johanna Hayes of Connecticut. Representative Lucy McBath of Georgia. Representative Joe Nagoose of Colorado. Representative Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts. Representative Lauren Underwood of Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, it says please remain standing, but I would now ask you to stand. For the singing of the national anthem, the black national anthem, lift every voice and sing by Grammy-nominated vocalist Mamuna Youssef, but before I do that, last but certainly not least, your current Congressional Black Caucus Chair, Cedric L. Richmond of Louisiana, you can do better than that. He's worked hard for y'all. An incoming CBC chair, Congresswoman Karen Bass of California. And now we will have the Black National Anthem. Before we have the Black National Anthem, I present to you Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton of Washington, D.C. Let's give the CBC members one more round of applause and sing this Black National Anthem. Stony the road we trod 
bitter the chastening rod felt in those days when hope unborn had died yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place which our Father's side We have come over a way that with tears have been born. We have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughter Out from the so much, Namuner, for that beautiful rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. As the CBC of the 116th Congress embarks on critical work on behalf of the American people, they do so in faith. Before I welcome to the stage our pastor who will be praying today, I also want to recognize Congressman Gregory Meeks of New York and Ilhan Omar of Minnesota who just joined us. Please welcome to the stage Reverend Dr. Norman Johnson, Sr., pastor of the First New Christian Fellowship Baptist Church. Shall we pray? Eternal God, we give thanks for this day, for this august occasion mantle of leadership being passed to Congress member Karen Bass. The political journey from Los Angeles to Sacramento to now Washington, D.C. has been one of powerful convictions, the ability to engage differing perspectives and yet remain grounded and focused on empowering others. May her leadership steer this caucus through the turbulent waters of this political moment. We pray that the legislative work of the caucus, this 116th Congress, may continue the best of the Congressional Black Caucus tradition of being the conscious of the nation. Prepare them for the great struggle ahead, a struggle for an inclusive America an America that values, protects, and gives place to children and parents seeking a better life for their families, an America that does not hold hostage the well-being of workers for political victory. Empower this Congress, or this caucus rather, 
that it might forge a path for the entire nation, remembering the least of these. We know that criticism will follow them. Insults will be hurled at members. They will face dismissive actions and some tables they may not be invited to sit. But encourage them. Let them not get weary and well doing, for they shall reap in due season if they faint not. In this great land, a blessed land, where democracy is yet in progress, not finished, may the Congressional Black Caucus serve as the leaven in the loaf that fosters a democratic vision of flourishing, compassion, and justice for all. And through their, their witness and work, may valleys be exalted, mountains and hills made low, crooked places made straight, and rough places plain, and your glory might be revealed, and all flesh see it together. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Johnson. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you all, or reintroducing you to many, to the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and representative from the state of Texas, please welcome the Honorable Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Good morning, everyone. It is my joyful task to welcome you this morning, but to be able to emphasize the most significant moment in history, and that is to welcome you to the class of the Congressional Black Caucus of the 116th Congress. It's a moment in history significant moment, but it is both a moment of history of the Congressional Black Caucus and the overall history of this nation, where in this moment, this class now stands at 55 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, some 22 percent of the Congress. The Foundation is excited about its founders. We stand on their shoulders. We exist for moments like this, and we exist because of the many partners and supporters and collaborators that make the foundation possible. We are excited about creating a pipeline of dynamic young leaders who will advance the global black community and shape the 21st century and beyond. And we are excited about the four decades of labor of the Congressional Black Caucus, of whose shoulders we stand, and we thank the families and donors for promoting this organization. To the Congressional Black Caucus, of course, we acknowledge that they are, in fact, the greatest organization with vision, foresight, hardworking, tenacious, passionate, compassionate group of leaders who never, never stop. And they have been founded since 1971, and they represent a long journey that has been taken from the 20th century and even members in the 19th century. The caucus has been at the forefront of major legislative initiatives, including civil rights, voting rights, criminal justice, education reform, and advancements in health and science. And the Congressional Black Caucus, of which this foundation is so proud, continues to be the conscience of the Congress. Chair of the foundation, I recognize that we are intertwined with their leadership and it is because of their stellar leadership that the foundation is strong. I want to thank this morning our friends and our sponsors. Some 33 companies are supporting this inaugural serenging of the 116th Congress of the Congressional Black Caucus. Please give them an applause. They are, in fact, legacy, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze partners. We appreciate you so much. We again thank our legacy sponsor, FedEx Corporation, and our friend Gina Adams, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs, 
for her role in shaping the company's vision for diversity. We thank her for all of the elements that she supervises, but most importantly, Gina, we thank you for your support. Gina, please stand so that we can thank you this morning again for your great work. We could not do any of this, the Foundation, Congressional Black Caucus members, without our family members. We take this significant moment in history to thank you for the role that you play in history, including the very special members of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and that is all of our spouses. If you're here, let us see you, please. We would not be who we were and who we are without the members of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Board. I offer a joyful thank you and a joyful noise for the investment and celebration of this great mission that you have committed to. We also have wonderful partners in the Corporate Advisory Council. We ask all of you to stand at this moment. The foundation, standing on the shoulders of all those that I have mentioned and taking this journey, has been very instrumental in programs like A Voice, preserving the history of members of the CBC, of discussing an endowment, of working on our mission of educating, creating new leaders for the 21st century. We are delighted to celebrate those interns, those scholarship recipients, those fellowship recipients, and we celebrate today in the ascension of one of our former Leadership Institute participants who is now a newly elected member of Congress and will today become a newly minted of our caucus. She participated in our Leadership Institute, then interned for then Senator Barack Obama, of course, the President of the United States. Later, starting today, her newest role will be Representative Lauren Underwood from the great state of Illinois. So as I close, we could not be who we were without the newly elected officers that will be sworn in, the outstanding chair uh, that uh, we are so eager to see her leadership, former Speaker of the California Assembly, our leader who will be introduced, Karen Bass, and the other outstanding officers. As we welcome the new members, our challenge again is to make a joyful noise, and to take our work as joyful tasks of which we will overcome all obstacles. And so it is important today to acknowledge that the foundation stands ready uh, to, in fact, ensure that we are partners with the Congressional Black Caucus. We stand ready to work alongside of the chair and officers in forging ahead for better things for the people of this nation and those who walk in the tradition of slavery. That was our past. But as we begin anew, more than 40 years ago, the Congressional Black Caucus recalled and accepted the challenge of Representative George Henry White of North Carolina. Representative White was the last of nearly 40 African Americans who were forced out of the United States Congress after emancipation and reconstruction and the beginning of Jim Crow. They were strategically forced and removed from office through the systematic voting disenfranchisement of African Americans and redistricting, a fight we continue. In his departing speech on the floor of the House, he said, this perhaps the Negro's temporary farewell to the American Congress, but let me say, Phoenix-like, he will rise up someday and come again. Today, my friends, it is safe to say We've indeed come again, and to borrow and embellish the words of Maya Angelou, and still we rise. March on until victory is won. It is my privilege at this time uh, to accept the tone of people of faith. And that is, it is my privilege to introduce the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi.
everyone. Good morning. That's the first time I have been introduced as a speaker of the House this time. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you all very much. It's an honor each Congress to be here with each and every one of you to celebrate the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus and to welcome the new members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Sheila, I appreciate your uh, introduction as a person of faith, as a person of faith, and I also salute you for your leadership of the foundation. I always like to tell the story of Sheila. She goes down to the border just the other day, a couple of days ago, she was there again. Uh, but on a recent occasion when she was there, um, visiting the little children who were there, a little baby just saw Sheila, just grabbed onto her and would not let Sheila go. And if that just tells you how she, how goodness emanates from her that a child would see and seek uh, in her the goodness of Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you for your leadership, Sheila. Where did she go? Oh, thank you, Jane. I want to thank Elsie Scott from the Foundation as well for her leadership, all of you. Just to, briefly, because we have a big agenda with the Congressional Black Caucus as it grows and grows and grows, at least eight new members from districts, not traditionally African-American districts, as we expand the size. I want to salute Cedric Richmond for his great leadership as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Each new pre uh, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus takes it to a new level of leadership, and Cedric certainly has done that, has certainly done that. Thank you. And it continue to be a, an intellectual resource to us as we fight some of the fights, well, engage in some of the challenges as we go ahead. And, and Karen Bass will lead us so beautifully. We're so proud of Karen Bass. Thank you. As you know, she was chair, uh, Speaker of the House and the Assembly of California. It's a remarkable thing uh, that she broke that marble ceiling there. And now here, in her leadership in Congress, again, a person concerned about children, foster children, just uh, transforming the thinking of the Congress on the subject and making a big difference in the lives of children, uh, again, foster children. She has been really angelic in her leadership in that regard. But don't be misled that, she, uh, uh, that that is her, her only focus, whether it's foreign affairs in terms of the Foreign Affairs Committee, whether it's Judiciary Committee, she is making her mark uh, substantively in so many ways, and now will do so in a bigger way as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congratulations <laughs> to you. So a couple things I just want to say to you uh, uh, um, as we proceed in the day's activity to this morning, we'll talk about uh, what we intend to do for the American people, and again, we'll hear it then. But I do want to make a couple of points. Under the leadership of Marcia Fudge, uh, Terry Sewell, John Lewis, we will be introducing and passing the Voting Rights Act in this yeah. Congress. We'll do, be doing all of, uh, we will be passing and the work with working with Eleanor Holmes Norton, we will be having hearings and putting forth legislation to giving voting rights to the people of the District of Columbia. We'll be doing all of this under the leadership of our big daddy, Mr. Clyburn. Uh, <laughs> a House Democratic Whip, Mr. Clyburn. Thank you for your leadership and your guidance in so many of these areas. And what's exciting is that we're going to have so many chairmen from the Congressional Black Caucus. I let us see. Maxine Waters, Chair of Financial Services. <laughs> Bobby Scott, Chair of uh, Education and Labor. <laughs> Elijah Cummings, Chair of uh, the uh, Government Reform Committee. Eddie Bernice Johnson, Chair of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. I got it. Protecting us all, the Chair of the Homeland Security Committee, Betty Thompson. <laughs> and that other chairman here. I don't know if any of the others are here, but chairs, chairs of subcommittees and the rest. We'll be talking to most of these people and calling them Madam Chair 
or Madam or Mr. Chairman. And it's a uh, it's wonder of how that the gavel in your hand, right? <laughs> And Joyce Beatty, Brenda Lawrence, Hank Johnson, and Don McEachin, Donald McEachin, and Stephen Horsford as new leaders of the Congressional Black Caucus joining Karen Bass. Thank you for your leadership. And as you know, the chair of our caucus, Hakeem Jeffries, is a part of our leadership. <laughs> as, as is Congresswoman Barbara Lee, first woman, African-American woman to be chair of our, of our caucus. So this leadership is not only leadership of this caucus, but leadership of the House Democratic Caucus and therefore of the Congress of the United States. We have important work to do in this Congress. We have to address the disparity of income in our country. We have to discuss, address climate crisis and what that means in terms of environmental justice in our country. We have to recognize that one in five children in America lives in poverty and that's intolerable to us. Uh, we have to do so, though, in a way uh, that treats everyone with dignity, whether we agree with them or not on issues. We want to respect every member of Congress, and we want every member of Congress to respect the truth. <laughs> and if we recognize the facts, uh, then we can act upon those facts and our values. And again, uh, again, the Congressional Black Caucus challenges us as the conscience of the Congress. We look to them for guidance. We congratulate them on swearing in, special swearing in here, each and every one of you for the intellectual resource, uh, the political astuteness, the generosity of candor that you're all willing to share with us uh, that makes our work more focused and more effective. So again, as Speaker of the House, it is my honor to welcome all of you to congratulate uh, the new leadership and welcome the new members of Congress uh, to be part of this transformative Congress at a time when we are challenged in a way that is historic. Only a few times in history have we had the kind of challenge we have today. But prayerfully, humbly, with confidence and pride, we'll meet the challenge and we'll make a difference in the lives of the American people led by the Congressional Black Caucus. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you. At this time, coming to the stage is Congressman Steny Hoyer, your incoming majority leader. Do you think the founders thought that there would be this many people on this stage? <laughs> and they shall grow in number. Amen. The speaker has spoken about our agenda. She mentioned the whip, Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn and I have known each other and worked together for over a half a century. It's amazing because each of us are 45 years of age. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker, Karen Bass. The chair, Karen Bass. The extraordinary political leader, Karen Bass. Thank you. Thank you for the leadership that you have brought to the Congress of the United States. Thank you for the leadership you brought to the Congressional Black Caucus. And thank you for uh, being the kind of leader that America needs in these times. We look forward to following. And then there's the outgoing chairman who made his mark, a uh, young man from Louisiana who brings common sense and courage and honesty uh, to his leadership. Cedric Richmond, thank you very much for your leadership in the Congressional Black Caucus. And then 
Chairwoman Sheila Jackson Lee. I know many of you have not heard from Sheila Jackson Lee very much. <laughs> but we love Sheila Jackson Lee, who heads up your foundation. <clears throat> Dr. Elsie Scott, who's the foundation interim president <clears throat> and CEO, thank you very much for your leadership. I am so proud to be associated with, for a very long period of time, with the Congressional Black Caucus. And I want to congratulate all of the members alike, those who are new and those who have been, who are returning. What a special day for them, for their families, for their districts, and for America. And for America. 55 member strong. Nine have been added. An iconic uh, leader has left, John Conyers. Keith Ellison has become the Attorney General. And Colin Allred, Antonio Delgado, Johanna Hayes, Stephen Horsford, Lucy McBath, <coughs> Joe Nagus, Ilhan Omar, Ayanna Presley, <laughs> and Lauren Underwood have joined their ranks. What an impressive group. What a wonderful addition to your ranks, members of the Black Caucus, led by your new chair, Karen Bass, and the newly elected leadership team. The CBC is poised to continue serving as the conscience of the Congress. Nancy said that. We called the CBC the conscience of the Congress. And there's not one of you sitting out in front of me that doesn't think the Congress badly needs the conscience. <laughs> By the way, not only in the Congress do we need a conscience. <laughs> I'll leave that up to where you think we need a conscience. <laughs> to be in the forefront of efforts to combat poverty, discrimination, promote equal justice, and build ladders of opportunity for all. I have been so pleased to work with Barbara Lee on a task force that says in the richest country on earth, we need to lift everyone out of poverty into the middle class. Barbara Lee, thank you for your leadership. <laughs> One of the greatest honors I have had in serving in the Congress of the United States has been to do so alongside extraordinary members. I could mention them all, but certainly I want to men mention my friend and one of our heroes, John Lewis. I've had the honor, because I've been here for some period of time, with Shirley Chisholm, Charlie Rangel, Ron Dellums, and Maxine Waters, and so many others who have made such an historic difference. And to the new chairs who have been introduced, congratulations to each of you, who I know will pursue your leadership roles with a great deal of integrity and focus on making America better, not just for those people of color and minorities, but for all Americans, because that is what your conscience leads you to do. The freshman class of 2018 adds nine new members, which I've already mentioned, each of whom brings a unique uh, background and energy to the caucus. And s Nancy mentioned it, others have mentioned it, so many of them represent districts that are not majority minority, they were chosen on the basis of their character. Martin Luther King would be so proud that that message resonated in this last election. With the CBC members taking the gavels of five committees and many subcommittees, you'll be able to shape legislation like never before. The diversity of your experience, 
the pain that you have experienced and that you know your families and neighbors and ancestors experience will inform you as to what we need to do as we go forward. Because when the CBC leads our caucus, it benefits. It benefits the House. It benefits our country. It benefits our people. And one of the most critical areas where the CBC has led our caucus in a push to restore the Voting Rights Act to, re to say to the Supreme Court, you did not get this right. The discrimination that existed is still in place and people are being sh given the back of the hand or the front of the hand. You can't vote, you can't register. We're gonna make it difficult for you. And therefore, the voices of all Americans are not heard. I am so proud to be here with my friends, the members of the Congressional Live Caucus. Uh, America is in turmoil. America is divided. The Johnson brothers said it to us all. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on. Nobody here, nobody that sits here believe that victory has been won. There is an unfinished agenda and there is no group in the Congress of the United States more than these 55 members of the Congress who sit before you who are any more committed to marching on for what America means and what America must be for all of our fellow citizens. God bless the Black Caucus who blesses their country. Thank you very much. And now it is my great honor and privilege to invite to the podium our Majority Whip elect and resident historian the Honorable James Clyburn from the state of South Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. So speaker designate Nancy Pelosi, Majority Leader, Standing Hoya, to the officers and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, former members, ladies and gentlemen. When the learned French historian Alexis de Tocqueville visited this country, he observed its greatness and set out to find the source of what he called the genius that made it so. After a significant search for the genius and power of America's greatness, he wrote in his book, Democracy in America, that the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair its faults. Abraham Lincoln saw slavery as a fault that needed to be repaired. So he wrote, signed, and issued several emancipation proclamations to repair the fault, thereby contributing to America's greatness. The United States Supreme Court contributed to America's greatness when it found separate but equal to be a fault that needed to be repaired. And in 1954, it issued a unanimous decision declaring separate but equal to be inherently unequal. President Lyndon Johnson saw discrimination in employment, voting, and housing to be false yearning to be repaired. So he furthered America's greatness by petitioning Congress 
to repair those faults. And Congress responded by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Law of 1968. Recent legislative actions, judicial decisions, and everyday experiences of the American people have exposed some significant faults in our system that need to be repaired. And the voters responded last November by installing a Democratic majority in the United States House of Representatives. And we are a significant part of that majority. Denying health care coverage to people with pre-existing medical conditions is a fault that the American people want us to repair. Denying safe drinking water to communities, clean air to citizens, and allowing catastrophic climate change to harm the, our environment are significant faults we must repair. Denying high school graduates access to debt-free post-secondary education is a fault we need to repair. <laughs> Denying our citizens access to clean, safe, quality housing in their communities that they can afford is a fault that must be repaired. Denying little children and their asylum-seeking parents due process, basic human conditions, and safety are faults we need to address. And finally, addressing the 21st century immigration issue by building a first century wall is intellectually dishonest and morally bankrupt. In a few minutes, we will all assemble in the great hall of the United States House of Representatives and officially become members of a new historic majority. The American people are expecting great things from us, and we must not disappoint them. For they know, as we know, that America does not need to be made great again. America is already great. Our challenge is to make that greatness apply fairly and equitably to all of its citizens. And I thank you. Thank you, Congressman Clyburn. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome singer, songwriter, Victory Boyd, who's singing one of her original songs, Who I Am. Welcome, Victory Boyd. Come on, y'all, wake up, wake up. Hello, everyone such an honor to be here uh, and perform for you all. Um, I'm accompanied by my younger sister, Momo, on bass. And I won't say too much, I'll just get right to singing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was born in a world of great divide 
We all live together, but we're not all on the same side. When I was a child, I didn't see all the lines. But that was until reality opened up my eyes. I saw people that looked like me pray for equality. While others believe in supremacy, I saw my people in chains mentally, and others I saw walking free. Every child needs to know who they're born to be. Am I born for greatness? Am I born to be free? And every day when I wake up, I hear bondage coming for me. Lies of society tear me down and take away my liberties. But what can I say? We've been this way for centuries. So I guess this is who I am. Is where I came from. These are my people. This is our struggle. I guess this is who I am. Is where I came from. These are my people. This is our struggle. Is who I. times when I wish I could run away but I can't run or hide from my reality I'm grown and I don't own a thing not a dime to my name or anything to leave for my kids to claim it's a shame Cause I wonder if they'll live better lives than me. Or will they grow up listening to society? Oh. Someday my life will come to an end. I don't know how and I don't know when But one thing I do know is that I'm tired of waiting For a change to come when I still got enough life in me To march towards freedom I still got enough fight in me To fight for our children Lift your head, child There's no need to hide gonna overcome with dignity and pride because this is who we are is where you came from these are your people this is our struggle I'm telling you this is who you are child is where you came from these are your people, this is our struggle, it's who we are, it's where you came from, these are your people, this is our struggle. inspired by people like you see here, the generation before me, that, that intentionally took the time to 
decide that they are going to inform us younger people of our real identity. We are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And despite what society um, historically has told us, you know, this is who we are right here. This is who we are. And I thank you for that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on, everybody. We're on our way to victory. We're going to march toward our destiny until we live in liberty. We're going to rise above poverty and change the whole society. We're going to get up in the morning and make our dreams reality hey come on everybody we're on our way to victory we're gonna march toward our destiny until we live in liberty we're gonna rise above poverty and change the whole society we're gonna get up in the morning and make our dreams reality I bet you're awake now. <laughs> this is who we are, Victory. Thank you so much for that inspiring performance. It's amazing. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Victory. The swearing in of congressional members is a long-standing tradition that celebrates and signifies the start of a new Congress. At the beginning of each new Congress, the CBCF hosts this ceremonial event to honor the legacy of the CBC and to mark the installation of its new and reelected members. Unfortunately, Mayor Willie Brown was not able to be with us today, but we have a wonderful, wonderful woman and friend of the CBC to take his place. Before I introduce Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the outgoing and incoming Congressional Black Caucus staff. So let's give them a round of applause for their work and their future labor. The ceremonial oath of office will be administered today by Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner. Dr. Williams Skinner is one of our nation's most influential religious voices and co-founder of the CBCF annual prayer breakfast whose commitment, genuine leadership, and unwavering support have left a lasting impact on individuals across our nation and around the world. Dr. William Skinner is a friend, known to many as the spiritual advisor to the CBC members, and a former CBC executor director for eight years. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Dr. Barbara William Skinner. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Having served in that founding 13-member Congressional Black Caucus as uh, executive director, it is my high honor to ceremonially swear you in. Imagine from 13 to 55, we never imagined in 1971 that God would move us to this place, but here you are for such a time as this. And you've come at a time in our nation that people are desperate for your leadership. We're living through perilous times with our nation standing on the precipice between hope and hopelessness. But here you are, here you are. And people in my neighborhood feel hope today because of your presence, because they know when you show up, as chairs of committees and subcommittees chairs, 
mercy and justice and peace and righteousness and fairness and fundamental goodness and values will show up. That's what we're swearing in today. We're showing the nation what a new standard of what it means in this Congress when the old, the sick, the outcast, the left out, I now first and not last. That's what we're swearing in ceremonially today, and it is my high honor to do so. And now I would ask you to stand, to raise your right hand, and repeat after me, saying your name after I say I. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear the faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely and without any mental reservations or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. God bless you. At this time, I'd like to introduce CBC Chairman Cedric L. Richmond of the 115th Congress. Representative Richmond is in his fifth term serving Louisiana's second congressional district. His hard work and commitment to improving the quality of life for his constituents, African Americans and all Americans, have earned Congressman Richmond the confidence and respect of his peers. Under Representative Richmond's leadership, the CBC has strengthened educational opportunities for African American students and HBCUs and advocated to restore voting rights. Lord knows we need that. The CBC also continues to help alleviate the persistent poverty and other disparities that plague communities across the nation. Although these accomplishments are significant, Congressman Richmond knows that the work to advance the African American community is far from finished. His determination and dedication to stand up for others have made him one of the most recognizable and effective leaders in Congress. Congressman Richmond. Let me, let me just uh, start by uh, recognizing my family who uh, have supported me and allowed me to do this for the last two years. So I'm going to ask my wife, my son Cedric, uh, to stand up, my wife Raquel, my son Cedric with the earphones on. <laughs> my mother, Maple Jackson, and my brother from another mother, Ike Spears, who is also here. <laughs> also want to thank the staff of the CBC. As members of Congress, we know how important uh, staff is. Uh, they're the life. Uh, they're the ones that are in the office all night to make sure the vision we have is accomplished. So I want to thank all of uh, the CBC staff, not just the CBC staff, but all of the staff for the members of the CBC. Uh, thank you for what you do. <laughs> this, year, this time two years ago, I was sworn in as chair of the CBC. I was honored to receive the gavel uh, from my friend and former judge, the former chair of the CBC, the Honorable G.K. Butterfield. And I had a chance to lead this 47-year-old caucus, which I admired since my days at Morehouse. And at 49 members, the CBC was the largest it had ever been. It was also the strongest it had ever been. One of our members was in senior leadership. Six of our members were top Democrats on their committees. And 27 of our members were top Democrats on subcommittees. But immediately, we had work to do. President Trump and his administration and congressional Republicans made sure 
of that by being hostile to any and every policy and program that bettered the lives of African Americans and other marginalized communities. But despite their hostility, the CBC found a way to win. It found a way to do what it's done since 1971, and that is to use the legislative process to right historic wrongs and give voice to the voiceless. You know, the CBC and what I admire so much about the people I serve with is we know we have a lot of work to do. Very rarely do they stop to pat themselves on the back or take time to brag. But let me take a moment to answer that Janet Jackson question of what have you done for me lately? It's because of the CBC that we now have two African Americans on the Senate Judiciary Committee, the second and third African Americans to serve on the committee in more than 200 years. Because of the CBC, we put billions of dollars in funding for anti-poverty programs, which were just included in the appropriations bill. Because of the CBC, a man who spent his career suppressing the African American vote in North Carolina will not be a federal judge. Because of the CBC, we started criminal justice reform and 4,000 prisoners will be released early. Because of the CBC, millions of dollars in funding for HBCUs, black farmers, and rural communities of color were included in the Farm Bill. Because of the CBC, the DNC and the DCCC did not take African American voters for granted this cycle and helped Democrats win up and down the ballot, including many candidates of color, and helped us take back the House. Because of the CBC, the board, C-suites, and suppliers of many corporations are, my, are now more diverse and more inclusive. Because of the CBC, two African Americans were hired to increase diversity and inclusion on our own Capitol Hill. The CBC did all of this by working together. And we will do more next Congress to get to greater heights. Because there's, there's one thing that we all agree on as CBC members is that we are more powerful collectively than we are individually. Yesterday was my last day as CBC chair. Oh, happy day. <laughs> Today, I will pass the torch on to my colleague, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who I am confident will take the CBC to higher heights. From her, from her days in the California General Assembly, where she became the first African-American woman in history to lead a state legislative body, to a work in Congress to address both the domestic and, and international issues affecting people of African-American descent. Congresswoman Bass has demonstrated tried and true leadership. She has also demonstrated the unwavering commitment to bettering the lives of African-Americans and other marginalized communities. The CBC, she will lead this Congress as the largest it's ever been. We've heard the number today over and over again. 55 members, five committee chairs, and from one to now three African-American members in Democratic leadership. Let me close with this before you hear from Karen Bass. It was two years ago that I stood at this podium in very vulnerable and dark times. And I said that there was one thing that I knew that this CBC was not going to do. We weren't going to laugh if we didn't hear a joke. We weren't going to scratch if we weren't itching. We weren't going to dance if we didn't hear music. And we're never going to run because we're always going to be true to our God and true to our native land. With that, let me introduce you to the next chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the phenomenal woman from Los Angeles, California, Karen Bass. Karen, I need to get
I will present the gavel to Chair, Chairwoman Bass. And unlike what G.K. Butterfield did to me, you can actually keep this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Today is a glorious day, not just for the CBC because we're 55 members strong, but today is a glorious day for our country. Today marks the beginning of a course correction, correcting the trauma we have all experienced on a daily basis for the last two years. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my family and friends who traveled all the way here from California to be with me. I want to thank my CBC colleagues for giving me the honor and the responsibility of serving you as chair during the 116th Congress. I want to acknowledge and thank the members of the executive committee, first vice chair, Joyce Beatty, second vice chair, Brenda Lawrence, Secretary Hank Johnson, Whip Don McEachin, Parliamentarian Stephen Hortsford, and members at large Dwight Evans and Frederica Wilson. And I most certainly want to thank our outgoing chair, Cedric Richmond, whose big shoes I will work hard to fill. From the 125-page document that he delivered to the White House that was entitled, This is What We Have to Lose, to the 1,000-page jobs and justice legislation, to his obsession with a number. Let's see, Mr. Richmond, I think that number was 218 that you were obsessed with. 218 takes us to the majority. Mission accomplished. So please join me in thanking him for his leadership. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well deserved. <laughs> so I'm especially honored to take on this responsibility at this particular moment in our nation's history. This year marks the 400th anniversary from when our ancestors arrived on this land. Some came here as free men and women, most were enslaved, and many of those that were free were ca later captured and forced into slavery. Our ancestors built the U.S. Capitol, they built the White House, and many of the historic buildings around D.C. Sadly, it took over 200 years to formally acknowledge their work. Representative John Lewis spent 10 years documenting their contribution to building the nation's capital. It took over 100 years to build a museum that acknowledges the contributions African Americans have made to our nation's development. And make no mistake about it, the wealth and the advancement of our nation is because of 200 years of free labor from our ancestors. For 100 years after the period of enslavement, U.S. law allowed black codes and other laws to arrest African Americans and enslave them again. U.S. law did not prohibit mass murders or lynchings to intimidate us from objecting to our oppression. U.S. law allowed for segregation, called it Jim Crow, called it separate and unequal, I call it U.S. apartheid. At each juncture, there were mass protests and movements that overturned our created laws to protect the African American population, including the civil rights movement that ended U.S. apartheid. Some of our senior members led that movement, Representative Lewis, Representative Holmes Norton, Representative Clyburn, Representative Thompson, and others. I mention this history because the African American experience is characterized by horrific oppression but amazing, amazing resilience. We organize, we struggle, we thrive. We win change in public policy in spite of opposition, and sometimes the very policies we win are attacked and attempts are made to move us backward. But each time there is a setback after a period of advancement, we fight back and we win, and when we win, we move the needle even further forward. In spite of gerrymandering and voter suppression, Stacey Abrams and Andrew Gillum were both nominated for governor of two southern states. 
Who, who would have imagined that? When they push us back, we find a way out of no way, so says Congressman John Lewis. But many times throughout our history, the accomplishments of our folks are not recognized, not known, or others receive credit. Until the movie Hidden Figures, how many of us knew about the African-American female mathematicians who helped figure out how to launch the first man into space? Well, the CBC has its own hidden figures. You might know them as individual Congress members, but because it is not their practice to promote their accomplishments, their incredible contributions have been hidden in legislation that others are credited with leading and securing passage. For example, since the founding of the CBC 48 years ago, CBC members passed legislation that led to the creation of thousands of black-owned businesses by making sure we had access to federal contracts. CBC members contributed to the downfall of apartheid in South Africa by forcing the U.S. to sanction that government. <laughs> CBC members led the first effort to provide federal support for community clinics. During the Affordable Care Act debate, CBC members pushed for resources to address health disparities in communities of color. And as was mentioned just two weeks ago, CBC members put $50 million in the Farm Bill for financial aid for students attending historically black colleges and universities. <laughs> CBC members are the reason the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau exists, and just days ago, criminal justice and juvenile justice was signed into law. All major pieces of legislation led by the hidden figures of the Congressional Black Caucus. But then again, 10 years ago this month, we watched one of our own, a fellow CBC member, take the oath of office as the 44th President of the United States. <laughs> and even though there was a concerted effort to make him fail, his presidency succeeded. His presidency was without a blemish. After eight years, no scandals, no investigations, no indictments. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The current president had all of this happen in his first few months in office. And so it's no surprise that he's obsessed with erasing Obama from history. The truth is, we're right in the middle of one of those historical moments where there is a concerted and deliberate attempt to erase, to reverse policy victories, not just from the Obama years, but policy victories won over the last seven decades. The very idea of a Barack Obama presidency brought to the surface a reality that should be celebrated in our country. America is becoming more diverse, and that diversity is leading to the browning of our nation. <clears throat> Instead of a celebration, the reaction from some has essentially unleashed a dragon, a dragon that is gasping its last breath, and so he is dangerous as he lashes out. The dragon is hate, the dragon is white supremacy, and they have a leader. In the past, people would have been embarrassed to be associated with white supremacy, but today some have moved from embarrassed to emboldened. However, at this moment in history, there is a fundamental difference. We will have tremendous power and influence. At this moment in history, we are equipped to lead like never before. We are equipped to govern, and we are equipped to resist when and where it's needed. We are equipped to lead with a vision for our country that not only lifts up our community, but lifts up the nation as a whole. When the 116th Congress is officially sworn in, there will be 55 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. This is the largest number of African Americans to have ever served in Congress. Two of our members, Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, serve in the U.S. Senate. They just passed legislation that finally outlawed lynching. Now, 
Now, now we're proud they led that effort, but we really are shocked that they actually needed to. In the House of Representatives, CBC members have more power and influence than any time before in history. The number three position in leadership and the highest ranking African American in the House, Majority Whip, Jim Clyburn. <laughs> Chairman of the Democratic Caucus, Hakeem Jeffries. <laughs> Co-chairwoman of Steering and Policy, Barbara Lee. Now, I want everyone to think and remember this moment a few months from now. I want you to just watch and see what happens when the gavels are placed in these hands. Science and technology, chair, Eddie Bernice Johnson. Please stand. Newsflash, she believes in science. Government reform and oversight, chair, Elijah Cummings. For an administration that has had no oversight, look out, because I hear a tweet storm. <laughs> Financial Services Chair, Maxine Waters. I don't need to say anymore, right? Maxine Waters. <laughs> Someone's financial records just might come to light. <laughs> Education and Labor, Chair, Bobby Scott. Public education will not be sold to the highest bidder. Homeland Security, Chair, Benny Thompson. <laughs> this is the largest federal agency in the U.S. government, and I think that we're going to find out who is making all the money off of the fake border crisis. Five members of the CBC will chair five critically important committees, and we're calling them the Big Five, and we want them to stand again. The Big Five. <laughs> we will watch them bring the CBC tradition, the conscious of the Congress, into each of their committees. And as was mentioned before, there is more power in this body. 28 members of the CBC will chair important subcommittees. Will the 28 chairs please stand? 28. And for the first time, we have the largest number of CBC members in many years, nine CBC members in the freshman class. <laughs> For the first time in 243 years of U.S. history, African American members of Congress will have tremendous influence in setting the direction of the country. While we work hard inside of government as legislators, our efforts to hold back the attacks and lead in a positive direction will be bolstered by a new and expanded grassroots movement that developed in response to the efforts to dismantle progressive policies, including civil rights legislation, dismantling protections designed to keep our air, water, and food safe, is just to name a few. This movement has expanded involvement in the democratic process, and the CBC in the 116th Congress will play a role both inside and outside of Congress, protecting the most basic right to vote and participate in our democracy. When this time period is over, we must make sure that we have not only prevented any movement backwards, but we strengthened and consolidated our gains. We moved the needle forward and expanded participation in the democratic process in an effort to ensure that hateful leadership never assumes power again. Colleagues, it is wonderful to be humble, to just focus on the work and not promote what has been accomplished. But part of making sure our folks stay strong and have hope and energy to keep up the fight to get through this tragic period in our history is letting everyone know specifically about the work 
about the accomplishments of the 55 people on this stage. We admonish our youth for not voting, but it is on us to show them what can be accomplished when they do participate. We have to give them hope to see that things can change so they can lead their generation in continuing the effort to make this country into a more perfect union. The conscience of the Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus, and the 116th Congress will fight fiercely against hate. We will not retreat and allow our past victories to be erased. The CBC in the 116th Congress will exercise every ounce of our power and influence to continue the fight for justice. Now let's get ready for the course correction. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Bass, and welcome. Finally, to close out the program, we have Dr. L.C. Scott, the CBC Foundation President and CEO. Dr. Scott. Why don't we give a big round of applause to Angela Rye for emceeing today. Angela Rye is a former executive director of the CBC. And one thing you see here today is that once you become a part of the CBC family, they always call you back into <laughs> service. So Angela was called back today to be MC. Dr. Skinner, who is the first executive director, was called back to swear in the members. And I was called back to be president again <laughs> of the foundation. But we are all part of the family we're happy to serve. I want to thank Congresswoman Bass for agreeing to take the new mantle of leadership for the CBC. We are confident that she will lead the caucus and indeed the Congress with the distinction and excellence that has been the legacy of the CBC leadership since its founding. Senator Harris came in after we had introduced all the members, so even though Congresswoman Bass recognized her, and she did not want me to do this, but we would like to recognize Senator Kamala Harris from California. And we have so many distinguished guests here today, but there's just one that I want to acknowledge because he was a leader that got a lot of black people into politics, Reverend Jesse Jackson. I want to thank Representative Richmond for your leadership as chair of the CBC and thank you for your support of the foundation during your chairmanship. And we know that you will continue to be a friend and a supporter of the foundation. I want to congratulate all the CBC members who will be holding leadership positions and you've met all of them including Majority Whip Clyburn, but we look forward to them being history making in the Congress as they seek to wield power, considerable power than we've ever had before with 55 members, especially for the benefit of all Americans, but especially for people of color and impoverished individuals. I want to congratulate the new class, Nine Strong, and I especially want to welcome back to Washington Congresswoman Lauren Underwood as the Congresswoman, because she's the first intern that came through the CBCF program that is now a member of Congress. <laughs> we look forward to great works from our new members and from our returning members. Our sponsors have been thanked, but it's never, it's never enough to say thank you to sponsors who helped us to provide this opportunity for people from the community, for elected officials, et cetera, to come and see this ceremonial swearing in. 
of the members of the CBC. So I want you to give a warm round of applause for our legacy sponsor, FedEx. <laughs> now Gina Adams is out there someplace. And to our platinum sponsors, American Beverage Association, Liberty Media Corporation, Narit Foundation, Atsoka, and Target, and to our gold, silver, and bronze sponsors. And lastly, I want to thank the chair of the CBCF, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, for your tireless work in working for the foundation and giving us leadership at the foundation. I would also need to recognize the staff of the Congressional Black, Black Caucus Foundation for all the work they do to support the mission and for all the work they did coming back early from Christmas vacation to make certain that you had a good program together. I want to thank Congresswoman Karen Bass's staff, the staff of the CBC, and all the congressional staff members who volunteered time to help with the planning and execution of the event today. We also thank our fellows and all the volunteers who helped us to manage on site today. So as I close, there are a few housekeeping matters I need to deal with. Dr. Skinner, who stepped in today to swear in the members, brought a gift for each of the members of Congress. She has recently published a book, and she brought a gift of the book to each of the members of the CBC. So before you leave the stage today, she will be here to the side giving each of you a copy of, your, of her book. Also, we will take an official picture immediately. We do not need anybody from the audience except the photographers to come to the stage, so please don't come near the stage because we have to get this official picture because members have to get to the Capitol Hill so they can be officially sworn. You know, we had a ceremonial swearing in, but they have to be officially sworn in so they can take on the work of Congress. So if you would just bear with us till we get this picture and allow the members not to be disturbed until we can do the class picture. Any amateur photographers out there, please don't rush the stage either because we need to get the official picture. So you can stay back there and take your pictures, but don't come up to the stage. So I want to thank all of you for being here today. We look forward to you continuing to, to support the foundation, and we hope to see you on February 26th for our heritage celebration. Thank you. We gon' walk it out.